The Studi is a beauty that is different by design. Up front, you'll find high style to the grill. Clean, sweeping lines. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, many of you, I know, uh, always ask us when is Mr. Anderson coming back to do his talk this year. Well, we're delighted he was able to join us. Matt is the John and Horace Dodge Curator of Transportation at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. In that role, he oversees the development, care, and interpretation of the museum's collection of nearly 300 motor vehicles. And he also oversees the collection of horse-drawn vehicles, uh, railroad locomotives and rolling stock, and also aircraft. So pretty much, it sounds like it moves under its own power. It's under Matt's purview here. <laughs> uh, Matt is a past president of the National Association of Automobile Museums and a current uh, board member of the Society of Automotive Historians. Uh, his previous stints included right here, the Studebaker Museum in South Bend, the Bal Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum, coincidentally in Baltimore, Maryland, and as well as the Minnesota Historical Society in St. Paul, Minnesota. If you're up on Saturday morning and you think, boy, that face looks familiar, you have also probably seen Matt on Innovation Nation at the Henry Ford Museum, where he's usually talking to Mo Rock on um, various things in the Henry Ford Museum. Today, Matt is going to talk to us about Preston Tucker and the Tucker 48. Without further ado, Matt Anderson, everybody. Thank you, I appreciate that. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, please silence your cell phones as we begin to talk to you. Well, thank you, Andy, and, and thank you all for being with us this afternoon, too. It's just a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> I know I say this every year, but this is an opportunity for me to repay the favors that Andy does for us over the summer. He'll come out to Dearborn uh, for our two car shows that we do in June and then again in September. And uh, he did double duty in September, not just that he narrate the cars in our passenger review program. He also gave a wonderful talk on Studebaker's early automobile production in Detroit. So grateful to be able to... Uh, repay that, that kindness. But we're here today to talk about a, a topic that's always been kind of close to my heart. It's a story I've loved uh, since, since my own childhood for reasons that we'll get into as we go along. But the story of Preston Tucker and the Tucker 48 and seemed like a good time to cover this topic given that this is the 75th anniversary of the uh, introduction and sale and, and short life, frankly, of that company. Uh, probably many of you in, in the room here are familiar with at least the basics of the story here, that uh, you know, Tucker's still a subject of a lot of debate uh, and admiration as well. To this day, he was able to build 51 cars before a shortage of money and, and a surplus of bad publicity uh, forced him to shut down. Uh, to this day, there's uh, a pretty strong belief that the big three, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, all conspired to shut him down. I, I think the truth is probably a little more simple. I think Tucker just kind of got in over his head, a, a small fish in a much bigger pond. He did manage to raise about $20 million toward the production of his automobiles and the founding of his company. Realistically, even in the late 1940s, he probably needed well, about 10 times that much, closer to $200 million to have a lasting shot at establishing a successful automaking company. But uh, with that said, we'll just jump right into it here. And the, the first photo I have here is kind of a treat. This was taken at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1932. Preston Tucker is there front and center in the vest and the, uh, the boater hat. You probably recognize at least a couple of the other faces there. Uh, on the far left, of course, Henry Ford. Uh, next to him, Harvey Firestone, uh, Henry's good friend. And then uh, with his back to the camera on the other side of Preston Tucker, that is the deuce, Henry Ford II, Benson Ford next to him, and then their father, Henry Ford's son, Edsel Ford on the far right. But uh, Henry was a great fan of the Indianapolis 500, made a point of trying to go down there as often as he could. In fact, he was there for the first race in 1911 and uh, some, many of them thereafter. But this was the occasion, of course, for 32. Uh, Preston Tucker himself was born in Capac, Michigan, which is about 60 miles uh, north of Detroit on the way to Port Huron, if you're familiar with that part of the state. He was born on September 21st, 1903. He actually moved at a young age with his family to Lincoln Park, Michigan, which is actually not too far from Dearborn, a little southwest of Detroit proper, very much a suburb of the Motor City. And naturally, growing up in that environment, he, he loved cars from boyhood. Uh, as an adult, he became a police officer with the Lincoln Park Police Department. He held various uh, jobs. In fact, he was an office messenger boy at uh, Cadillac as a, a youngster and then later on had jobs uh, for Ford Motor Company as well. I believe he worked for... Uh, Chrysler a little later on in his uh, career. But by the mid-1930s, Tucker was working with Harry Miller on uh, race cars. And Miller, probably many of you are familiar with, with him as well. We'll talk a little bit about him here in a moment. But 
one of the most successful designers of American racing cars of all time, but certainly in that time, the 1920s and 1930s. And uh, Miller, unfortunately, he could make fast cars, great cars. He, he didn't really know how to make money at that, how to do it profitably, or profitably I should say. He uh, was better at spending the money than raising it or keeping it. So Tucker came on board to kind of take over the business management, the promotion side of Miller's business. And that's what led them to connect with the Fords. Uh, Harry Miller built 10 uh, front-wheel drive race cars for the 1935 Indy 500, all powered by Ford's flathead V8 engine. And uh, it was a, a very fast-moving project, and frankly, a project that didn't have enough time to uh, quickly work out all the bugs. So they ended up building 10 cars. I think of those 10, only five of them managed to qualify for the race, and none of them actually managed to finish for reasons we'll get into in a moment. But uh, that's what first brought uh, Tucker into Henry Ford's orbit. And any of you who've ever uh, done any public speaking, you know that uh, the first rule is to know your audience. So I've actually brought a second photo here just, just for you that we'll share. Um, oh, I think I messed up here already. There we go. I will not push that button again. As I was saying, I brought a, a special photo just for this audience here, taken on the same date on the same occasion. This time we have uh, Mr. Firestone, the Ford family, with Peter Chris, who drove one of the five Studebakers that that company had entered in that year's Indianapolis 500. Uh, unfortunately, not a great race for him. He um, hit the wall on the 178th lap and ended up finishing in 15th place. And uh, I think it was at the 1934 race where Chris actually not just hit the wall, but he went over the embankment and was thrown from the car and unfortunately killed. Uh, so that it would be about two years before that when this picture was taken. But uh, nice to see him flying the Studebaker colors in any event. Uh, this is the car that Miller and Tucker put together with Ford Motor Company. And basically, uh, the Fords, Henry and Edsel, supplied the money. Uh, according to the original agreement, it was supposed to be $25,000. Those prices kept climbing to fifty, seventy-five thousand, until it was, I think, something over 115000 by the time all was said and done, which is another classic kind of Tucker uh, um, trait to spend more money than he was bringing in, in addition to Harry Miller doing that. And as we mentioned, the cars just did not do very well. And the flaw they had was with the design of the steering knuckle, which you'll notice is right next to the uh, manifold there on the engine the hottest part of the engine. So what would happen is the cars went around the track, the engine warmed up and it basically boiled away the grease, the lubricant in the steering knuckle. The steering would lock up and of course you can't steer in a race car, you're in a world of hurt. So that was it. But um, as we like to say, had they given prizes for looks alone, I think uh, they might have had a trophy in their, their future in 1935 because it is a beautiful car, almost uh, Art Deco in a sense with that V8 logo on the side so prominently as well. Uh, looking now, of course, at the Jeep, and I just wanted to use this as an illustration to talk about another uh, one of Tucker's pre-automobile projects. Um, with World War II looming, he and Harry Miller together co-designed a fast and relatively light combat car that was powered by a modified Packard V12 engine. Uh, the car was supposedly capable of speeds well above 100 miles an hour. In fact, Tucker said on a level straight road they could do 114, 115 miles an hour with the car. Uh, the Army ultimately passed on the combat car, and they passed in favor of smaller light reconnaissance cars like the Jeep that we're looking at here. But a part of Tucker's combat car design, it had a gun turret in the back uh, with a kind of a plexiglass shield and then electric motors that controlled the speed of the turret so it could move much faster, more agilely than other turrets of the time. And to this day, there's a kind of a myth that, frankly, Tucker himself helped reinforce that those turrets were adopted by the uh, Army and by the Army Air Force and used widely on the big bomber planes, the B-24, the 17, the 29. Uh, that is not so true. In fact, uh, the Tucker, Tucker turrets had been designed for a B-18 aircraft, which was never really produced in large numbers and never used on the front. And in any event, it, it's sort of a moot point because when you submit contract work like that to the Army, they then own the patents. That's a part of the deal. So then they can use them freely on other things. So Tucker wasn't going to make uh, certainly any money from it or, or much of a name from himself in any event. And it's also worth pointing out that at this time, Tucker's manufacturing facility was a tool and die shop that was in a, a small building directly behind his home in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where he was living at the time. So he was never going to have the capacity to produce turrets in large numbers anyway, which ties in nicely with the Jeep on a couple of counts. Probably a lot of you know the story, American Bantam had designed the Jeep vehicle and then the government 
took the patents as a part of the agreement and gave them to Willis and to Ford to build the Jeeps because the government just realized that Bantam wasn't going to have the resources, the facilities to build the Jeeps in the quantities they needed. So they, they had kind of the same experience Tucker did with his turret. Now moving on to the Tucker automobile, and we've got a, a sales brochure here, the surprise car of the year, it's called. Uh, Tucker had dreamed of building and marketing a car of his own for many years, even before the war, but he realized when World War II had ended, it was a, an absolute seller's market, perhaps the best seller's market since the early days of the Ford Model T in the teens when people were buying their first car, period. So almost anyone out there was your theoretical target market. But uh, after World War II, of course, none of the automakers were building civilian automobiles during the war, so you had a drought throughout the conflict. But then we sometimes forget the Great Depression had been going on for the decade leading up to World War II. So you had folks who may not have purchased a new car in 10 or 15 years. So everyone, that was the first thing they wanted when the war ended, to go out and buy a new vehicle. And Tucker realized that this was the perfect opportunity for him to jump in and uh, work toward his vision. And uh, Tucker advertised it as the car you've been waiting for, we see here with this beautiful illustration. I should point out, too, one of our audience members brought in this great uh, 1 18th scale model of a Tucker, so you can see it in three dimensions to get an idea of what the car looked like uh, physically, not just from these illustrations. Uh, Tucker's brochure here, the copy, some of it reads, it's finer and more luxurious than the most expensive cars of today, yet priced in the medium field. Uh, the brochure also describes it as completely new, yet with engineering principles completely proved in 15 years of rigid tests. And this was one of those occasions when Tucker would stretch the truth, right? If he'd been thinking about the car for 15 years, that counted as 15 years of R&D work, even though it might have been 13 years of dreaming and two years of actual work. But those are details. Let's not concern ourselves with those things. Another page from the brochure here. Tucker had promised a groundbreaking car with a rear engine, which was the most unconventional and probably the most striking aspect of the vehicle. Uh, All-wheel independent suspension, disc brakes, something that he would have seen in the world of racing. In fact, all of those things he would have seen in the world of racing. Uh, the rear engine, according to the brochure here, meant that heat, fumes, and noise do not reach the passenger compartment. And the six-cylinder engine gave overlapping impulses that matched the smoothness of 12 cylinders. So he's suggesting the comfort and ride quality of a 12 with a six cylinder. Uh, he also planned to have fuel injection to take the place of a conventional carburetor and hydraulic torque converters that would provide flowing power from engines to wheels. And this was uh, the most uh, sort of outlandish or out there uh, aspect of the Tucker design. He was going to do away the, with the conventional drive shaft and gear uh, ratio set up and use a, a torque converter on each of the four wheels and use hydraulic fluid running from the engine to the torque converters to power the car. The theory being that then you wouldn't need a transmission. And uh, say this was cutting edge uh, business. Torque converters had been used at that point in maritime applications and ships. They'd also been used to some extent in tanks and powering armored vehicles during the war and famously by the hydromatic uh, General Motors. But they weren't developed in the sense that they would be even just a few years later when uh, automatic transmissions became more widespread, so that would prove to be the most difficult technical problem that Tucker had to overcome. But he, he wasn't worrying about those kinds of things when he was putting out brochures like this. Here's a photo of the actual prototype, which was unveiled in a glitzy ceremony at the Tucker Corporation's uh, headquarters, which were in Chicago, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, the unveiling took place on June 19th, 1947. About 5,000 people came out to see the car that Tucker had been promoting. There was a lot of interest in this vehicle, given the uh, claims that were made about it and just the dramatic and unconventional look of the car at that time. Uh, Tucker had been promoting the, the car in newspapers and magazines, as we said. The crowd absolutely loved the car when it was revealed. And in the following weeks, many investors and dealers signed on with Tucker to become a part of this program based on the enthusiasm from this public debut. We're looking at another photo here of the original prototype and uh, Alex Tremulus, a designer who would later, well, he worked for Ford before Tucker and then would go on to go back to Ford and then with others as well over the years. He really deserves a lot of credit for taking Tucker's basic design and then refining it into something not only more practical but more, more aerodynamic, going from the sort of faux streamlining that Tucker had originally designed in his uh, first drawings. And uh, we have to give uh, Tremulous um, fans, too, for a car that is uh, absolutely distinguished in its looks and its feel. Of course, the, the biggest characteristic you can't see in this photo but are the three headlights on the car that set it apart from anything else. Also, you'll notice though, from here the rear fender vents, which uh, you can just see the... Uh, in fact, I think I might have a pointer here. Um, 
Well, I don't think it's working, but in any event, you can see the, the vents right there ahead of the uh, fender and the rear there, uh, of course, to cool the rear-mounted engine. And uh, my favorite part of the Tucker, the, the almost proto-fastback rear end there, which shows off very well on the model here, too, with the backlighter of the rear windshield going down to that grill, which, again, is, after all, in the back where the engine is. And uh, the prototype, uh, we should point out, too, is always easy to pick out in photos. The, the production Tuckers, the, the 50 that were made after this, as um, shown by the model, had what they call suicide doors. The back doors open backwards. The front doors opened in the conventional way. And uh, the, the idea was there just to provide more legroom getting in and out of the car. They did the same thing with the Lincoln Continentals in the 1960s, going with the suicide doors just to make them a little roomier on the interior. The original prototype, though, had conventional forward-hinged rear doors. So you see the door handles on the back of both the front door and the back door on this car. It also, I think the prototype was the only one that had the Tucker name on the front fender there as well. That would have been dropped in later units, but uh, great photo. I should point out, too, Tucker, it's fitting that we have this 118th scale model. In some of his magazine advertisements before the prototype was built, he actually had, I think it was a 118th, maybe even a 124th scale model made of what he thought the car would look like, and then he used uh, forced perspective photography. In fact, not unlike the Anthony Schmidt exhibit out in the Studebaker Museum atrium there, he took pictures of the model against real settings to make it appear as though it was a real full-size car. So again, stretching the truth uh, with the best of them. So clearly to build his car and to build the company itself, Tucker was going to need a lot of money. Uh, he made an initial offering of 5 million shares of stock in the Tucker Corporation of America, and as many as 44,000 people bought shares by September of 1947, raising about $15 million for the company. Uh, Tucker also sold franchises to eager dealers. And, uh, this was quite a leap of faith on the part of the dealers. Of course, they were going to benefit from the seller's market as much as anyone, but to uh, sign in and agree to build cars which hadn't been, or to sell cars rather, which hadn't been built yet, takes quite a bit of faith. And we're looking at one of the actual uh, Tucker stock certificates here, this one now in the collections of the Henry Ford. Uh, Tucker also sold more than stock, and this is, I think, what got him into trouble with the Securities and Exchange Commission, what uh, first got the government interested in his activities. He also sold accessories, so things like uh, suitcases, seat covers, and radios. And we see a Tucker radio, again, in the collections up at the Henry Ford. And he was selling these accessories for cars that, again, had not yet been built. And the theory was that by buying one of these accessories, customers would have at least something tangible, something real, some piece of the car. But they would also get, and this was maybe clever on Tucker's part, they would get a preferred spot on the waiting list. So if you bought a radio, your name was put on a list and you had preference over someone who just walked to a dealer off the street when the first cars were built. So you were kind of buying your place in line. And here's just a closer look at the uh, radio. Obviously, the sooner you bought it, the sooner you would have got your car. That was the thinking anyway. Uh, the unconventional program raised about $3 million uh, in uh, sales, total sales, and then about $1 million of that was pure profit for the Tucker Corporation. And, of course, the program also helped to some extent calm those Tucker dealers who uh, at least now had something physical that they could sell to their customers. And uh, looking again here at the prototype, and after Tucker unveiled it in uh, June of 1947, he took the car on a nationwide publicity tour. And uh, this photo was uh, taken and, and distributed as a part of a press release at the Museum of Science and Industry. And I should say it was the New York Museum of Science and Industry, not the one in, in Chicago, uh, not too far from us right now. But uh, thousands of people paid 48 cents, logical enough for a car called the Tucker 48, for a chance to look at the car. And thousands more, of course, would have seen the prototype in other cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, and uh, even Detroit, places like that. Another great vintage advertisement with one of the earlier design proposals for the car. You'll notice it looks different from uh, the actual finished production automobile. Um, Tucker promoted the, the sedan heavily to interest investors, uh, as well as would-be customers, of course. And his claims, uh, so, well, not just sometimes, they often got ahead of reality, and this ad is a good example of that. Uh, some of the features it mentions here, the rear engine, the four-wheel independent suspension, did make it into the production cars. But this is also talking about things like the fuel injection, the torque converter transmission, the disc brakes, which ultimately were dropped due to manufacturing difficulties. And um, Tucker had always held that he would have put these features into later cars or perhaps subsequent models at some point. Just it was a matter of time. They had to get so many saleable cars ready to uh, keep the dealers happy, to keep the customers happy, particularly the ones who had bought those accessories. So these were all kind of stopgap measures. And... Um, 
that's kind of the first red flag when you see any big opportunity like this. When you start cutting the corners or trying to, to do the stopgap measures, you know that uh, there are deeper problems uh, at, at root here. Here's a, a section of the, the Philadelphia Sunday Bulletin from April 18th, 1947. We see Preston Tucker there right at the middle with some of the executives and, and directors involved in the Tucker company. And uh, among um, Tucker's opportunities there, or among the ads here, whether Tucker's, among Tucker's, among Tucker's efforts, that's what I'm trying to say here, uh, to kind of bring some legitimacy to his company was to recruit people from some of these other automakers. So as we look here, uh, this one mentions the Tucker Corporation's seasoned management team, which includes veterans from General Motors, Chrysler, Ford, and Borg Warner, in addition, of course, to Mr. Tucker himself. And one of the folks that Tucker recruited has kind of an interesting history with Ford Motor Company. The fellow in the yellow circle there is Fred Rockelman. And uh, Fred had served as president of the Plymouth Company before joining Tucker. But before his time at Plymouth, he had been with Ford Motor Company. In fact, he'd been with Ford Motor Company for many years as everything from a test driver to a general sales manager uh, to an administrator for the Detroit Toledo and Ironton Railroad during the 1920s when Henry Ford actually owned a railroad in addition to his automobile company. Uh, for Tucker, Rockelman served as vice president of sales, but uh, I mentioned Rockelman having been with Ford for a long time. Indeed, this photo was taken uh, on the occasion of the building of the 15 millionth and final Ford Model T, May 26, 1927. So the eight senior most Ford Motor Company employees, not including Henry himself, all gathered. They each got to stamp one digit of that 15 million serial number into the engine block there you see in front of them. So. I, among the others, uh, there's Rockman, there's Frank Kulik, who was Ford's first uh, factory racing driver. Charles Sorensen's the tall guy in the middle who would later go on to great success at Willow Run. Uh, P.E. Martin, Gus Stegner, any, any number of uh, celebrities in the Ford Motor Company world at that time. But uh, that was Rockman's background. So clearly, folks with some credibility. And that was the whole point in Tucker hiring them, that they could bring that kind of credibility and that kind of experience to his firm. Uh, the Tucker Corporation was based in Chicago, as we mentioned. Uh, they were located in a 480-acre war surplus factory that had been built for Dodge to build B-29 bomber airplane engines. Uh, the plant was capable of uh, holding as many as 35, 40,000 people. At its peak, Tucker employed about 1,600 people, so clearly they had room to spare. Now, Tucker did anticipate at some point he'd have as many as 3,500 employees once they reached full production. Suffice it to say, they never got there. Uh, and today, incidentally, the, the Tucker plant is, uh, the site is still there. Some of the plant has been readapted to manufacturing of all things Tootsie Rolls. The Tootsie Roll company is located there. And then there's a shopping mall that's located uh, just south of the Tootsie Roll factory. But if you're over there, it's on Cicero Avenue, just a little south of Midway Airport. And uh, I think there might even be a marker out there now uh, commemorating Preston Tucker and the Tucker factory, even though it was only there for a short period of time. So you see the illustration of the uh, plant taken from one of the brochures, and then the, uh, the badge there is an actual employee badge that is in the collections there at the Henry Ford. So it's a nice piece to uh, look at. Some of the uh, details on the Tucker, again, that get credited to Alex Tremulus, the swooping fenders and the six exhaust pipes there in the back, uh, kind of give you a sense of sportiness in the car, make it look a bit like a rocket ship almost. Uh, there's also some practicality involved with the uh, center headlight, which we'll talk about in a moment. Notice the tail light there in the back. It's not only visible from the back, but also visible from the side. So it's sort of a combination tail light and side marker lamp. And this is years before side marker lamps were required by law. Um, you'll also notice that uh, the doors cut into the roof at the top. And it's also maybe even better seen on the car here, which uh, accomplish two things. They give you a little more headroom getting in and out of the car, but they also add to the kind of streamlined or futuristic appearance of the vehicle. Airplanes had doors that are cut into the roofs like that. So it, it tied the car in with themes of, of aviation and flight. And of course, the grills we'd mentioned there, more clearly seen on the rear fender there or in that inset picture up at top left that allow cooling air to reach the engine. As we said, the, the headlight in the center was really the defining feature of the Tucker and what it makes it stand out uh, from other cars even to this day. And the light was connected to the car's steering mechanism. Now, it wasn't on all the time, but if you turn the wheel uh, more than 10 degrees in either direction, the light would switch on, and the theory was it would help eliminate your way around turns there and eliminate blind spots. Uh, we should point out there was also a switch that could deactivate that center headlight altogether, so it wouldn't come on at all. The reason for that is that uh, 
Three headlights were not yet legal in all 48 states at that time, and uh, it wasn't really until the mid-1950s when federal regulations on how many headlights you could have were uh, kind of set in stone. In fact, there were a number of years in the late 50s when automakers would have two different versions of models. Some cars would have the, the four headlights, the quad headlights in the front, others would just have two headlights in the front, so it was a bit of a pain to get all that sorted out. Another point I love, and this is another picture of the uh, prototype there, which we looked at earlier with the uh, conventional rear doors, but uh, as they were getting it ready for these promotional photos, they had a couple of pieces of the car that weren't quite ready, the most prominent of which being the front bumper. So if you look at the picture, you might notice the bumper maybe looks a little off. It is not steel, it is not chrome, that is actually a wood mock-up that they then painted with silver paint and put uh, aluminum foil in the background there to give it kind of a little metallic glint. But um, again, you, you do what you have to do for the photos, right? It's just, uh, just for publicity, so no one was too concerned about bending the truth in that regard. A look under the hood here in the back. Uh, the Preston uh, Tucker prototype car actually had a 589 cubic inch six-cylinder engine, but uh, there were all kinds of development problems with that engine. And uh, it is a massive displacement, 589 cubic inches. And Tucker always said, well, Harry Miller always said, if you're going to build them, build them big. So that's why he wanted that larger displacement. But it didn't work. So Tucker was uh, kind of left scrambling, looking for another source for engines. And he was connected with uh, the Air-Cooled Motors Company of Syracuse, New York, which was building air-cooled motors, as the name would suggest, for helicopters, six-cylinder units that would sit up vertically in the, um, in the car. And that company's kind of interesting, air-cooled motors. They were the descendant of the Franklin Company, which had built air-cooled cars from about 1903 right on up to the first years of the Great Depression. So uh, after the, the car company folded, they built these helicopter engines, then they were in trouble financially. In the late 40s, Tucker was able to step in, purchase Franklin, and purchase the engine and convert that helicopter unit uh, from air-cooled to liquid-cooled for conventional use in the back of his car and uh, kind of kept the, the, the Franklin company going a little longer or the air-cooled motors at that point. And that company did, in fact, survive Tucker. They were building engines right into the mid-1970s. We talked about stop gaps and compromises, and there would be more. Um, Tucker came up with the, the complex hydraulic drive system we were talking about, but his team just couldn't make the thing work. So they needed, again, a stopgap measure, some kind of a conventional transmission they could put in the car. They didn't have time to design something from scratch. So they settled on rounding up as many cord automobiles as they could find. And, and keep in mind, this is 10 years now since the last new cord had been made. So they were scouring junkyards and used car lots trying to buy these vehicles. And uh, I think they rounded up about 22 complete cord transmissions from these sources, and, and that gave them enough parts to build 18 actual functional transmissions. But again, this was just supposed to be a temporary measure until uh, Tucker could develop its own manual and automatic transmissions. Uh, incidentally, the Franklin engine there, that six-cylinder engine they used, that produced 372 pound-feet of torque, and those are almost like muscle car numbers of the 1960s. Uh, one of the problems that they had with these transmissions is the car produced so much torque you could actually strip the teeth right off first gear taking off if you weren't careful. So it uh, would have been interesting to see if these cars had made it into the wild in big numbers, how often that particular mechanical problem would have sent them back to the shop. Another problem Tucker had, and, and this was not so much uh, a problem of access to parts, it was his own sort of um, indecision that uh, led to this issue. He hemmed and hawed for a long time over the design of the steering wheel, knowing that this is you know, one of the most prominent parts of the car that you see when you get behind it and uh, kind of an advertising opportunity. He finally settled on a really pretty beautiful design that was kind of offset with uh, two different sides to it um, on either side of the hub with uh, the Tucker family crest. Uh, placed in acrylic in the center of the hub, uh, a beautiful wheel that, that never really made it into production because by the time Tucker made up his mind, it was simply too late for the contractor to make the deadline to get the wheels for those first 50 cars. So uh, Tucker is now in desperation, and again, Alex Tremulus steps in as the hero. We'd mentioned that he had worked at Ford Motor Company for a while before joining Tucker. He called up a friend at Ford kind of under the radar and said, you know, we're, we're in a real fix here. Can you help us out? And uh, sure enough, the friend there at Ford sent Tremulous 50 steering wheels from the Lincoln Zephyr. And uh, these were slightly flawed units. They, they were perfectly serviceable, but not quite good enough for Lincoln's quality control. And we should point out again, the Zephyr hadn't been produced since before World War II. So these were units that were being kept for replacements or for dealers stock when someone would come in and need one uh, fixed or, or otherwise replaced. But um, I've got a photo here 
of a Zephyr from 1942. And you can see, indeed, it's, it's the same steering wheel. Notice the uh, kind of grooves that are carved into the bottom and the top of the wheel there. You can also see um, there's a horn ring on the tucker end on, on the Zephyr. The horn ring is a complete circle on the Zephyr steering wheel. So the one thing that the tucker designers were able to do kind of to make the wheel their own was to just cut off that top portion. So you just have the lower horn ring. But uh, same story, those wheels were supposed to be a stopgap measure. In fact, Ford insisted that uh, as soon as Tucker got his actual steering wheels, they were to remove those units and destroy them. They could just use these for, for testing or at least to get the cars to dealers or what have you. But uh, again, Tucker never got that far. So every Tucker that survives today has a Lincoln steering wheel on it. Now that's always interested me, even though this was done kind of under the radar, the, the fact is that this kind of undercuts the thought that all the folks at the big three were trying to stop Tucker. I, frankly, I don't think they ever felt particularly threatened by this guy. He was like, you know, sort of a fly, if you will, in terms of, of their size. So he wasn't going to be a problem uh, for them for, for many years. So they probably just kind of sat back and watched him self-destruct rather than actively participating in it. Now, uh, there wasn't all bad news for Preston Tucker. In fact, there was some good news here with uh, the issue of Mechanics Illustrated magazine with uh, automotive writer Tom McCahill, who had a chance to test drive a Tucker. And uh, McCahill actually praised the car's smooth ride, its quick acceleration, and its roomy interior in this uh, article in the August 1948 issue and say it was a good bit of uh, news for the company because now Tucker's starting to face some serious financial and legal troubles. And it's worth quoting just the... Um, first paragraph from that article so you get a sense of the general tone of, of McHale's review. He says here, Tucker is building an automobile and brother, it's a real automobile. I want to go on record right here and now saying that this is the most amazing American car I have seen to date. Its performance is out of this world. Why do I think so? Wait until you have an opportunity to drive the car and you'll know what I mean. And sadly, of course, for most folks, that opportunity would never come, but this would become sort of the heart of the whole issue with Tucker's uh, later trial and, and charges, whether he committed fraud or whether he actually intended to build good cars or, in fact, did build decent automobiles. And, and the verdict at the time and since has been that at the end of the day, he did build workable, functional, in fact, quite good automobiles. So he, he never intended to defraud the public from the start. He certainly played fast and loose with the rules, but uh, his heart was in the right place, if not uh, the, the legally correct place. Tucker's unconventional fundraising methods, particularly that accessories program with the suitcases and the radios, uh, drew the attention of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC used its federal powers to investigate Tucker, and they ended up charging him with 31 counts of mail fraud. Of course, using the mail, you're now going between state lines, so it becomes a federal crime. And uh, Tucker was taken to trial, and uh, it was uh, a fairly quick trial. The government sent and called several witnesses and uh, went on for several days with their testimony. When Tucker's team was given the chance to mount their defense, they took the somewhat controversial step at the time of not calling any witnesses. In fact, their whole argument was that there's no point in us calling witnesses because the government has failed to make their case. Kind of a risky gamble, but one that actually paid off because Tucker was ultimately found not guilty. But it was a pyrrhic victory, we might say, because it had cost Tucker all of his personal fortune, and it also cost him all of his credibility. Uh, he may have been found not guilty, but the company itself was finished, and it brought an end to the company and his dream in 1950. Uh, now, Tucker's personal optimism never failed, and uh, he reportedly said even Henry Ford had failed the first time out, and in fact, not to correct Mr. Tucker, but Henry Ford failed his first and second time out before he found success with Ford Motor Company. So the lesson itself, I guess, is true. But uh, Tucker had hopes of coming back. He had talked about building sports cars in Brazil in the uh, early 1950s. Uh, unfortunately, he'd been diagnosed with lung cancer in the mid-50s and uh, succumbed to the disease on December 26, 1956. And uh, if you're curious, I, uh, this photo doesn't have a credit on it because I actually took it myself. Tucker and his uh, wife are buried in Flat Rock, Michigan, not too far from, uh, from Dearborn, at the Michigan Memorial Park. So if you're ever interested in going to check it out, it's a beautiful grave. It's, it's maintained, not surprisingly, by members of the Tucker Club of America. They always make sure to have flowers there. I took this photo in February, hence no flowers, but uh, a nicely maintained grave with a, a photo of the car there. And it says there, too, you know, the, uh, the father of, of the Tucker car there. Uh, of course, Tucker's story uh, kind of faded away after he passed away in 1956, but it received a massive boost, and, and undoubtedly the biggest boost it's ever received 
1988 with the release of the movie Tucker, The Man in His Dream. And uh, this, this has a soft spot uh, in my heart. I, I was just the right age when this movie came out. I mean, 12 years old and saw it in the theater, absolutely loved it. And it's really what got me interested in cars. And it's probably not an exaggeration to say that I wouldn't be standing up here in front of you if not for this film. So I, I owe it some credit there. But it was directed by Francis Ford Coppola. And um, Francis Ford Coppola, we should point out, the Ford in his name is no uh, coincidence. His father was a musician, and he was an assistant director on the Ford Sunday Evening Hour, the radio program that Henry Ford used to sponsor from Dearborn in the 1930s and 1940s. So Francis Ford Coppola was born in Detroit. His father named him in honor of his ultimate boss. I guess that's the way to put it. And uh, Coppola's father actually invested in the Tucker Company, about $5,000, of course, lost all of it. But even though the company failed, his father still kind of admired Tucker for what he was doing. Francis Ford Coppola admired the story and, of course, grew up with it. Uh, later on, when The Godfather hit, and, of course, he became uh, very successful, he purchased a Tucker uh, for his own collection, number 1037. He later bought a second Tucker, number 1014. And uh, then with backing from his old friend George Lucas, uh, who himself owns Tucker number 1009, uh, he was able to direct this movie, put this movie together. And uh, it's really, it's a, probably a lot of you have seen the film. If you haven't, I encourage it. It plays a little loose with the facts, but it is a stylized piece. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's almost an homage to the Frank Capra movies of the 1930s, 1940s, the little guy who takes on the big companies and wins. Jeff Bridges played the role of Preston Tucker. Joan Allen appears as his wife, Vera Tucker. Martin Landau is there as a kind of composite character to uh, represent Tucker's financiers. And uh, interestingly, Lloyd Bridges plays a senator from Michigan who's kind of a stand-in for the big three in the evil corporations. And this is the issue I take with the money. Lloyd Bridges, in, or with the movie rather, in the film, Lloyd Bridges pretty much comes out and says, you know, if you don't stop making these cars, we will take you down, we will destroy you. So the, the movie simplifies the plot and makes it the story of the evil big three against the, the good little guy doing everything by the book, which is not exactly how it turned out. And I, I watched this film a couple of days ago just in preparation for this, and I'd forgotten one of my favorite characterizations in it is an appearance by Dean Stockwell as uh, Howard Hughes. really does a great job of capturing the, the mystery and, and strangeness of Howard Hughes, but it was Hughes who originally connected Tucker with, with Franklin or the air-cooled motor company to get his engine, so it's fun to have that betrayal in the movie. We should point out, too, even though the movie plays fast and loose with the facts, there were, of course, still members of the Tucker family around, including Tucker's widow, Vera. She was still very much alive in 1987-88. They all consulted on the film, participated to some extent. Uh, but as I said, historical accuracy generally gave a backseat to drama in the movie to keep a, keep a good story moving under 90 minutes or so. Uh, but one way or another, the movie did correctly generate the kind of excitement that Tucker's car generated in the late 1940s. And I'll just throw this in as a bit of trivia. I went to the Internet Movie Database. Uh, you can look up the budget for any given movie. This film was budgeted at about $23 million, so it cost slightly more to make the movie than Tucker managed to raise to build the company and the car in the first place. So that's inflation for you, I guess. And uh, we'll get wrapped up here. This is a photo that was taken a few years ago in 2018 at the Pebble Beach Concord Elegance. Now, at that point, it would have been the 70th anniversary of the Tucker automobile. And the folks at Pebble Beach wanted to go all out and have a class of Tucker cars there. They were able to round up a dozen of these cars from around the country for the car's anniversary. So we had cars like uh, ours from the Henry Ford, which is the one you see here right in the front, which I'll talk a little more about here in a moment. But also cars from the Stalls Automobile Collection up in Chesterfield, just north of Detroit. Uh, cars from the Swigert Museum. They own the prototype Tin Goose, still very much around. And also, and, and this was touching, two of the cars were there. And I had to look and read the names twice before I believed it. Both George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola had their Tuckers at the show as well, so you can't do any better than that, I think. And uh, as I mentioned here several times, we do have a Tucker in our collection at the Henry Ford. This is a photo of it right here. It is car number 1016, for those of you who are keeping score. And uh, our car is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, we've had it since 1956 or 58. Uh, so more or less 10 years after the company had gone out of business, and we've never restored it. It's never really been driven any significant distance. We, we've never sort of tinkered with it. So uh, to our knowledge and to the knowledge of many Tucker aficionados, 
It is the most original of the surviving Tucker cars. I mentioned Tucker had built 51 cars altogether. 47 of them still survive. A couple of them were scrapped or lost to accidents over the years. But uh, ours is kind of the textbook for folks who are going out to do Tucker restorations. And you know, a lot of the cars that do survive, they've been restored now once, twice, maybe even three times over. So ours, we take it very seriously as a need to keep that car in its original condition. But how we got our car is uh, even the more fascinating story now. Tucker, of course, had been generating a lot of bad headlines for his uh, sort of questionable fundraising practices. One of those bad stories about him ran in the Detroit News, where they basically uh, accused Tucker of fraud right in the headline. Uh, Tucker, having won his civil trial, or his, his criminal trial, excuse me, decided to launch a civil suit against the Evening News Association, publisher of the Detroit News newspaper. He was going to sue them to the tune of $3 million for libel, saying that they accused him of being a, a fraud. So uh, the company then, in anticipation of going to court with Preston Tucker, decided, well, we better get a hand on one of these cars and figure out if this is the real deal or if this car is a fraud. So this is indeed the car that the Detroit News publisher purchased and studied. They kind of took it apart to see if this thing was the real deal or not. And, and they ultimately did decide that, you know, this was a fully functional car. It wasn't a gimmick. Sure, he made some shortcuts, but it looked like his intentions were good. Um, as it turned out, we mentioned Tucker contracted lung cancer or, or developed it and then passed away in 1956. So he actually died before the, the case reached uh, court. So kind of settled the matter then and there. But the evening news then found themselves with this car that they didn't need anymore. So they gave it to the Henry Ford in 1958. So our car has a nice little dramatic story to it before it came to us. And uh, the only thing we've done with the car in 1987 is we redid our auto exhibit uh, for the automobile in American life. Um, but chrome was looking a little shabby on the front and rear bumper, so both of those were removed and re-chromed. But that is it. Other than that, that car is in more or less original condition. As I said, to our knowledge, the most original of the 47 surviving Tucker cars. So always like to give you some uh, homework or some optional homework at the end of these talks. Certainly see the movie, Tucker the Man in His Dream, if you haven't. But if you're interested in reading more about Preston Tucker and his car, these three books will, will do you just fine. Uh, the Indomitable Tin Goose is the earliest that was published in 1960 by Charles Pearson, who was something of an ad man for Preston Tucker. In fact, he wrote a couple of the early magazine articles Tucker had used to promote the car. And uh, his book is good. It's, um, it, you know, there's no real historical perspective, having been written so soon after Tucker had passed away. But the upside is, of course, most of the folks who were involved in the car and the program were still alive and very well. So he was able to talk to the kind of firsthand sources and accounts about what happened. Uh, another kind of first-hand source, uh, Philip Egan's book there, Design and Destiny, the maker of the Tucker automobile. He had been one of the stylists working under Alex Tremulus at uh, the Tucker Company. He published his own memoir in 1989 about building the car. In fact, this is fun. I, I still have the copy I bought, coincidentally, at 14 years old in the Henry Ford Museum gift shop. So I've uh, got it back on my bookshelf there in the office. And then I think the easiest book to get a hold of and the most accessible, both in terms of, of being able to find a copy, but also in terms of readability, it's a pretty breezy, fast read, is uh, Steve Leto's recent book here on Preston Tucker, his battle to build the car of, of America, or a car of tomorrow, excuse me. It's, uh, it, that's a great source because obviously it was written after the movie came out and there's been a few more decades, frankly, of historical perspective. So he's able to put Tucker more in his, his proper time and place and talk about the car and... Uh, the value that these cars have achieved among collectors. And it wasn't too many years ago. Tuckers don't change hands very often because there are so few of them. But I think the last time one went up at auction, it sold for about $2.2, $2.3 million in the mid-20-teens. So uh, not inexpensive vehicles for, for what they are. We'll uh, put up one last slide here with all the vital specs for you, your horsepower, your uh, engine displacement, your price, $2,450, which would be a mid-priced car at that time, a Ford or a Chevy would have been closer to the, uh, you know, the sub $2,000 range. But um, if there are any questions or, or comments or anything, I'd be happy to uh, try and entertain some of those to the best of my ability. Or if you have questions about the Henry Ford in general, yes. Ah, that, that is an excellent question. I, I looked at it before I came here. I want to say it's about 12,000 miles. So quite a bit, but most of that would have been put on by the Evening News Association. And, and uh, some of it was put on, believe it or not. And this was kind of a fun surprise. Uh, some of you might know the name Les Henry. He was the curator of transportation at the Henry Ford Museum from the 1960s into the early 1970s. His uh, son came by to visit this summer, and uh, he brought some snapshots and things with him. One of the pictures he had was a photo of our Tucker on the road. They drove it to a meet in, uh, it might have even been in, in Hershey, but in Pennsylvania at one point. So they put some miles on it 
doing that. And uh, you know, I kind of shuddered a little bit, but it was a different, um, different attitude at those times. You know, they wanted to drive the cars, use the cars. We probably wouldn't be driving out on public roads today. But uh, yeah, I think it was about 12,000 on the clock. So. Yes? Uh, are you oh, looking at the vent there, right ahead of the rear wheel? Yeah, yeah, this is just a vent here. There's one on the other side as well. The engine, of course, back here, so keeps things cool, absolutely. And uh, that's also, you know, it's a fun game with those cars of the 40s, the 50s, especially. Find the fuel filler cap, and uh, it's actually hidden behind this vent, so the whole thing would fold open up, and there would be a little filler neck there. Um, is, was there another? Yes. No, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, not very often. In fact, we haven't started it in probably a couple of decades. And that's generally our policy with, with all of our vehicles. We'll remove the oil, the lubricants, the fuel, and, and more or less uh, preserve the cars for long-term storage. Now, I'll tell you, again, since we're here among friends, one of the issues we have at the museum, uh, it's a big building. We have some kind of drafty old doors there. We're approaching our 100th uh, birthday in, 19, or in 2029. Uh, so we have an issue, or we had an issue at least into the um, 80s and 90s. The museum wasn't air conditioned until 1996. So if you go there in the summer, we'd open up these big doors, set up big fans to try and keep it a little tolerable in there. Well, that, that encouraged the raccoons to come in from time to time. So we had some raccoons getting into the tucker at one point in the mid-1980s and uh, you know, did a little bit of damage to the cables. Nothing that couldn't be repaired, nothing that was too serious, but... Uh, Part of the reason as well why we haven't started it, just because we don't know there might be further issues. But uh, beware of the raccoons. Yes? Could you go back to that steering wheel picture? Of course. Want the uh, Zephyr or the Tucker? Yes. That's the type of gear shift that's in a core. Yes, yes, a pre-selector. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I, I think they designed their own lever, but the mechanism was the same that, that Cord was using, where you'd shift that, and then it would be a vacuum actuator that actually did the shifting in the transmission itself when you press the clutch. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> no, it's uh, made by Bendix, Andy says, yeah. There we go. Yeah, excellent. No, it's it's an interesting uh, dashboard too. It, it's uh, simple, I guess. That's the word I would put to it. I mean, there's not a whole lot in the way of control. Certainly not what we're used to today. But you do see some aviation influence with the levers. They're like airplane controls over on the left side of the steering wheel. The uh, speedometer is kind of interesting too. Notice the needle when it rests. It's at the 12 o'clock position, and then the numbers start going clockwise around it. So you'd start at zero, and then by the time you get up to 11 o'clock, I think it says 100 or 90 or something on the the speedometer, but an interesting design. Now you can see why. Different by design. Studebaker is. Studebaker is. Studebaker is. Studebaker is.